Okay, welcome to this webinar of the Jerusalem Press Club, which is part of the series America Votes 2020. We are privileged to host today Ambassador Martin Indyk, twice a U.S. Ambassador to Israel between uh, 95 and 97, and then again 2000, 2001, also the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs during the Clinton administration. And then special envoy under President Obama, Secretary Kerry in 2013, 14. Um, and he's uh, the author of uh, a, an intimate account of American peacemaking diplomacy in the Middle East and was a vice president of the Brookings Institute. And today he's a distinguished fellow at the Council of uh, for Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Indic. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, in normal times, we would uh, be saying the king is dead, long, long live the king, but these are not normal times and King Donald seems to be alive and kicking. So what is your view from Washington on this unprecedented uh, scene? Salam Ori and uh, good morning everybody from New York. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, with you, uh, Uri, and the uh, Jerusalem Press Association, which uh, I remember very fondly for many years. Uh, so the, uh, the situation is uh, perhaps looks uh, more disturbing from afar than it actually is uh, up close. Um, there is a clear winner in Joe Biden uh, and Kamala Harris, nothing that Donald Trump uh, can do legally through a, a legal resort is going to change that result. Even if he turns up a hundred dead voters um, in uh, Pennsylvania, um, it's not gonna have any impact on the vote, nor for that matter, the recount in Georgia. Um, these kinds of things result in minor changes in the vote. Um, but the overall vote is, is clearly um, in, in Biden's favor, which is why he declared victory. Uh, and so what's actually going on is a kind of psychodrama in which uh, the president, uh, current president, Donald Trump, is coming to terms with his loss. Um, it's clearly very difficult for him. He is the ultimate sore loser. Um, and uh, it's so delicate that uh, his closest aides and family are even scared to tell him the truth. But eventually, as his power slips away and, and as the Republicans leave him in increasing numbers, which will happen over the next few days, as it becomes clear that his legal recourse is not going to change anything, then I think the number of people around him that will tell him it's time to move on. And it's better that you go out graciously and you can claim your own victory in terms of the huge number of people that came out to vote for you, 71 million or so. Uh, the fact that uh, Republicans are likely to control the Senate and uh, made gains in the House. And, you know, you, you have plenty to be proud of. That was the message that I think President, former President George W. Bush tried to uh, express to him yesterday in, the, in, in uh, congratulating Joe Biden as president-elect, but also pointing out what Trump had achieved and could, should be proud of. And I think that's the, that's the approach that we're gonna see. But it's, it's only a matter of days uh, and, uh, it's not going to change the outcome in any way. Before we discuss the possible Middle East policies of the Biden administration, let's talk a bit about the four years of Trump. How would you characterize the US-Israeli relations during the Trump term? Was he really the greatest friend of Israel, as he is sometimes uh, described here, or was it more rhetoric than uh, substance? No, there was plenty of substance, and he certainly can uh, make a claim to uh, to be the greatest friend of Israel. I think probably the majority of Israelis view it 
that way. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the things he did, um, they're controversial. Everything about this man is, is controversial. So yes, he recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, chapeau, but uh, in the process, he drove the Palestinians out of the peace process, out of the American led peace process. Um, and that is not, in my view at least, uh, to Israel's advantage. Um, it's important that the United States be a credible uh, broker between Israel and, and its Arab neighbors, but in particular the Palestinians, because the Palestinians are the <laughs> neighbors that are within you and they are not at peace with you. Uh, they are in, in conflict with you that, that needs to be resolved for Israel's own future. Um, and so, I, you know, I question the, the great achievement there. Uh, I have a very strong personal objection to um, recognition of uh, Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights because it's a direct contravention of 242, UN Resolution 242, which is the very basis of the peace process between Israel and its Arab neighbors, peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, Jordan and Israel. And um, one day, eventually, um, peace between Israel and Syria will become possible again. And, and um, the idea that, that uh, uh, Israel should have sovereignty over the Golan Heights recognized by the United States just goes against the potential for, for resolving that part of the conflict. And that's a hot conflict these days. Um, but as I say, I, I'm probably in a minority of one in that regard, certainly amongst Israelis, but I don't think it, it was a helpful uh, step. And it had ramifications beyond Israel by, by recognizing the acquisition of territory by force, um, something which we strongly object to in the case of Putin's takeover of the Crimea in the Ukraine, for example. Um, and there are many other examples of that. And the United States should not be blessing that kind of approach to, to disputes between uh, states. Uh, and knocking off Soleimani was a big plus, I think, you know, we have to give him credit for that. Uh, and, uh, but I think that his record on Iran uh, is uh, very problematic. Because we'll, talk, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about Iran later. Okay. Okay. I want to ask you about his uh, deal of the century, which won a, a lot of criticism, even ridicule. But can you try and give him some credit for trying to think out of the box and perhaps offer a fresh approach which has never been used uh, when decades of US uh, attempts by presidents and secretaries of state and envoys like yourself have not been uh, extremely successful. Yeah, so uh, it was definitely a fresh approach and it had one very important but clearly unintended consequence, which was that its blessing of Israeli annexation of 30% of the West Bank, including all 131 settlements, including the illegal settlements, um, the settlements that are illegal in Israeli uh, terms, uh, had the uh, unintended consequence of creating the opening that uh, the Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, used to normalize his relations with Israel. And where I do certainly give Jared Kushner credit is that uh, he had the uh, ability to pivot from pursuing a uh, deal of the century that was going nowhere to taking advantage of the opportunity to normalize the relationship with both the UAE and Bahrain and then with the Sudan. So they definitely um, deserve credit for that, but it was not their intention when it comes to what their intention was to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the fundamental problem with their approach was that it resolved all of the issues in Israel's favor. And that is not a recipe for ending the conflict. 
um, it's a you know it's it's a victor's uh, resolution, uh, which would have to be imposed on the Palestinians. And if there's one thing that Israelis have surely learned by now is they're not going to succeed in imposing it a solution just as they would resist any imposition by outside uh, forces as well. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that, that just in its own terms, the deal of the century uh, did not achieve its objective, did not even come close. There was no way the Palestinians are gonna negotiate on this basis. And as a result, it will uh, leave office uh, with President Trump and, and uh, will go into the dustbin of history with uh, all those other plans, some of which I was uh, involved in. Having but said still, that- Still, uh, still uh, Martin, sorry for interrupting you, but the conventional wisdom was that once the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is resolved, the rest of the Arab countries won't have problem in reconciling with Israel. Uh, but he turned the table. He, he the, see, look at the Abraham Accord seem to have contradicted this yeah. approach. What is your take on this? Right, the one who turned the tables was Mohammed bin Zayed, not Donald Trump. Um, and he's the one that deserves the credit. He was the one that was courageous. He was the one that broke the mold. And uh, the United States supported him in doing so, which is most constructive role that the United States can play. And that's why I say I would give Jared Cushion credit for that. He deserves credit for that. When Jimmy Carter was pursuing a comprehensive peace uh, and trying to uh, reconvene the Geneva Conference, he had the unintended consequence of driving Sadat to Jerusalem. And it took Jimmy Carter a lot longer than Jared Kushner to come around to something like 10 days to two weeks to coming around to supporting uh, what Sadat was doing and supporting a separate peace between Egypt and Israel. But it was Anwar Sadat, not Jimmy Carter, that deserves credit uh, for that. And of course, Menachem Begin for, for seizing the opportunity. Anyway, so I, I, I think that, that when it comes to the question of, of normalization before resolution of the conflict, yes, that equation has uh, been established now, um, and and uh, there's no going back on that. Um, the reason it's not that previous administrations in the United States opposed normalization. The U.S. policy has been to promote normalization between Israel and the Arab countries since the beginning of the American-led peace process. It is a fundamental problem with the peace process that that uh, Israel has in the past uh, not been dealing with countries or parties that recognized its existence. The big breakthrough with the PLO was when the PLO recognized Israel's existence. So, you know, it's been a, a, a mainstay of the American approach to try to get recognition for Israel as a Jewish state uh, and, and all uh, administrations were pursuing that, including the Obama administration. John Kerry spent a hell of a lot of time trying to convince uh, the Arabs to recognize Israel as a Jewish state because that was what Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time was focused on, not on normalizing uh, with, with uh, the Emirates, but normalization had taken place. And you remember this, Uri, from the 1990s as part of the, the peace process. The key difference now is that these Arab states, because of the rise of the threat from Iran, because of the sense of common interest with Israel, because of America's retrenchment from the Middle East, see that their interests, their, their national interests are, are served by normalizing relations with Israel and not waiting for the Palestinians. And that is a key, key break. And one that I think can be exploited to the advantage of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict too. When you arrived in Israel in '95 as ambassador, there was some 130,000 settlers uh, in Judea and Samaria, and today there are 430. Um, um, and and it seems that the settlement issue also for Biden 
himself, he expressed himself more than once on this, is, is a sore issue. How, how do you think it's going to evolve? Well, um, I don't know. And, and I want to be clear here, even though I, I have many friends who will be uh, in the Biden administration, I don't uh, speak uh, for him or them. I give you my own personal assessment for, for what it's worth. Uh, I think that, that uh, the settlement issue is obviously a neuralgic one and one which democratic administrations have, uh, and Republican administrations uh, for that matter, before Trump came along, uh, have had a really difficult time dealing with. And, and nobody has really come up with a good way uh, of, of dealing with it. Uh, and certainly uh, Joe Biden was vice president in the Obama administration when uh, Obama, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State managed to get wrapped around the axle of settlement activity uh, for no good result. So I think that, that he and his advisors are gonna be wary about getting involved in another confrontation over settlement activity. That said, I do believe we will see a return to the traditional policy. I'd be very surprised if the uh, approach of, of the uh, Trump administration were continued. That is to say, to consider um, settlements as legal, um, to uh, no longer view them as um, a uh, unhelpful or obstacle. Uh, to one, 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 one of the really, two questions just came in. One is that Israelis are not so much for settling and for occupation, but they're afraid of terrorism coming from uh, those areas. Uh, so how could Biden reassure uh, or mitigate their fears? And second question, will Biden continue the approach of bringing in more Arab states to reconcile with Israel? So on the terrorism issue, I don't think that, that there will be any um, reduced uh, effort to fight terrorism. Uh, on the contrary, I think there will be great continuity in, in all of those, those efforts, um, including uh, a more, uh, a, a, I think, an early uh, uh, insistence on a resumption of uh, Palestinian-Israeli security cooperation, which the United States has played such an important role in terms of building Palestinian capabilities in that regard to fight terror. Um, so I, you know, I would expect that with a resumption of uh, American-Palestinian relations, which I think will happen quite quickly, um, there will be an expectation that the Palestinians will return to uh, the uh, uh, usual relations that they've had uh, with Israel particularly on the level of security cooperation, but also in terms of economic cooperation and revenues and, and so on. So, um, but I don't expect that, uh, well, there, I don't think there'll be any change on the question of fighting terror. I do uh, not expect that there'll be a major new initiative um, by uh, the Biden administration uh, in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. And that's for two reasons. First, Biden has a lot of other priorities, urgent priorities, um, which include, of course, the pandemic, um, the economy, uh, when it comes to foreign policy, China, um, and uh, climate change. Um, and then uh, uh, comes Iran, and we can get to that uh, Later, yeah. but, but those are the priorities. In the Middle East, it's gonna be Iran. It's, um, the people around Biden and Biden himself uh, were there when we tried the last time uh, through final status negotiations that I was involved in that, that Kerry was responsible for getting started. 
uh, collapsed. And uh, they're, they're all very familiar with what happened. And I think that they have a pretty clear sense of what Netanyahu and Abu Mazen are willing to do and are not willing to do. And I do not believe that as long as these two leaders are around that they will see that there's, there's a reason to invest um, energy and, and capital in, in that. Uh, but getting things back to, to a more manageable state uh, and, and trying to find ways to rebuild trust and confidence between the two sides is I think where they're likely to uh, focus uh, the limited energy that they'll put into the Israeli-Palestinian dimension of, of and US bringing and, and bringing more Arab states to the table because it yes. seems uh, simpler than uh, exactly. solving the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. It's what's referred to in Washington as low-hanging fruit. Um, and I think that, that, first of all, as I said before, there's no resistance to this idea. It's always been. Uh, part of the American approach to peacemaking. Uh, and uh, I think there are, there are a, a number of opportunities to spread uh, the normalization, but also to turn it to the advantage of uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations. Uh, the Emirates required Palestinian cover for their move. Right. And that led to annexation being taken taken off the table. Uh, and uh, I would expect that the Saudi Arabia, which is the big prize here in terms of normalization, uh, that the Saudis will ex will want cover, Palestinian cover. And uh, that will put Israelis before a choice. Do they want normalization with Saudi Arabia or do they want to continue settlement activity? For example, uh, I don't know what the, what the Saudis will require, but they will require more than what the Emiratis got when it comes to the Palestinians. Right, um, a question. So, uh, if, if Joe Biden called you tonight and said, what should I do with the Middle East or with the Israeli-Palestinian, uh, conflict, and how can I avoid mistakes or, or things that didn't work in the past? What would you answer him? Well, I would first of all say that it's not ripe for, for a breakthrough between the Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, that uh, there needs to be the uh, uh, a sorting out on the Palestinian side. There'll be a succession struggle sooner or later. Um, and uh, on the Israeli side, there's not a, uh, there's not a great opportunity uh, given, given the, the makeup of the Israeli government and its leadership. Um, so uh, if he were to ask me, which I don't think he will, I would say I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't invest a lot of energy now in in trying to achieve a breakthrough. I'd rather think that, as I said, there's opportunities in the normalization process that can help the main task, which is to rebuild trust and confidence between the Israelis and the Palestinians. This is going to be a gradual process. You need to approach it as a gradual process, as a longer game, uh, that in which relations with the Arabs can help um, and that we should be looking to steps on the ground that in, can improve uh, the environment between Israelis and Palestinians. I hope uh, that the Palestinians will come to see that anti-normalization didn't work for them. They had 18 years since the Arab League peace initiative was first announced and the linkage was established between normalization and resolution of their conflict. They wasted 18 years. Uh, and I hope that they will come to terms with that reality now and see that normalization with Israel is actually to their advantage, not just between the Arab states and Israel, but between Palestinians and Israelis. 
and and that 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 can be an important part of the process of rebuilding trust, which could then lead to a resumption of the final status negotiations further on down. Uh, how right. can you how can how can you build trust when uh, when it is obvious that uh, the Middle East in general and uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in, in particular is not on, uh, high on the on the priority list of a Biden administration. Because I think it the, the, the important shift here, um, and you Israelis say changing the cassette, except it's not a cassette anymore, but what do you say now? Uh, the disc. The, yes, the, okay. <laughs> it's not a disc anymore. Changing the cloud, I don't know, but whatever. I think you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, it's no longer the United States that is going to determine uh, the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's going to be between Israelis and Palestinians to do that. You're the ones who have an interest in resolving this conflict, and now you have a greater interest than the United States has used to be that, you know, we felt it was a vital national interest of the United States um, to resolve this conflict. But the reality was that the only reason we thought that was because the Arabs made it a condition in their relations with the United States and with Israel, and they're not doing that anymore. So there are lots of other reasons why it's not a vital interest of the United States because we are shifting our focus to China, because we are retrenching from the Middle East, because we don't have a vital interest in the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're able to build uh, burgeoning relations between Israel and the leading states of the Sunni Arab world, Egypt, Jordan, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, um, all of that's possible now without resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it's not a vital interest of the United States. Uh, we have a vital interest in seeing Israel survive and prosper. And its survival is not in question anymore, but until it resolves its conflict with the Palestinians, its survival as a Jewish and democratic state is challenged. And, and therefore, it's in Israel's interest to resolve this question, and it's our interest to help you. But it's up to you, and it's up to the Palestinians. You know, Palestinians come to me and say, you know, what is the United States going to do for us? And I say to them, what are you going to do for yourselves? It's you <laughs> who have to take the initiative now, not the United States. Martin, uh, there's a question of personalities. Uh, Biden often says, he quotes himself saying uh, about uh, Netanyahu, I don't agree with any damn word he says, but I love Bibi. H how would this love discord mix work, especially on settlement? Well, they do know each other very well in every respect. <laughs> that is to say, Bibi has known Biden for a long time, but Biden has known Bibi for a long time. Um, and uh, therefore uh, understands very well uh, Bibi, Bibi's nature and his politics. <clears throat> so uh, that's number one. I think that's good uh, for the relationship. Uh, when it comes to settlements, as I said, I don't think he's going to want to have a fight over settlements. But if Bibi makes it an issue, um, then then there will be a problem there. Um, and I think it would be very wise for Bibi to back off from any settlement activity um, because both he and President Biden are going to have a lot of tension over a much more consequential issue for Israel and for the United States, which is Iran and Iran's nuclear program. We'll and talk a bit going, about Iran in a second, okay? All right, but that's going to be the thing that's that's going to cause tension because, and that's going to come very quickly because the United States under President Biden 
uh, will be seeking to bring uh, Iran, Iran's nuclear program back under control again by getting it to return to its commitments under the JCPOA. And uh, that will be a, a priority order of business, followed by a, a negotiation on outstanding issues and issues that are problematic in the JCPOA. That is, I think, the, the policy that, that President Biden will pursue. And that is not a policy that Netanyahu uh, is likely to embrace easily. Um, he clearly wants to increase the sanctions. Uh, it seems that he and Pompeo are gonna do that as uh, Trump uh, leaves the White House. Um, Biden is going to, I think, use the leverage that Trump has provided him with by all of these uh, unilateral uh, sanctions. Um, but he's going to, um, I think, lift or return to the JCPO, and that means lifting some of the multilateral sanctions that have been reimposed by the United States uh, once it left the JCPOA. So there's going to be tension over, over the overall approach. Bibi believes in maximum pressure, and that's not the approach that, that Biden is going to pursue. In fighting the Iran deal, Netanyahu has alienated many Democrats, especially with his uh, appearance in the Congress, defying uh, President Obama's policy. Do you think that uh, now Democrats will hold a grudge toward Netanyahu? And more generally, has the support of Israel become a partisan issue during the Trump-Netanyahu joint era? Well, Bibi made it into a partisan issue, deliberately. Uh, and so now he's going to um, have to uh, uh, make up some ground. Um, but there's no doubt that he made his bed um, with the Republicans and with, with Donald Trump in particular. And um, now there's a, uh, there's a new sheriff in town. And uh, he's a Democrat. Uh, and so uh, he's going to have some work to do to uh, restore the uh, uh, margin for doubt. Let's put it that way. Um, I, I don't, I, as I say, I want to emphasize, I don't speak for Joe Biden or his administration, his incoming administration. So I don't, you know, I'm giving you my personal opinion here. But I, I, I think Bibi no longer will get the benefit of benefit of the doubt. And it will no longer be a case of Bibi telling um, the President of the United States to jump and the President saying, how high, Bibi? Um, mm -hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different in which uh, uh, Bibi will have to, to show his friendship as much as Biden will want to show his friendship uh, for Israel. Are you concerned about the possible erosion in the support of Israel in general in the American public and in particular in the American Jewish community where according to a recent AJC poll, three out of every four people uh, traditionally vote for a democratic candidate? Yes, and I think that the last figure I saw yesterday was 75% of, of American Jews voted for the Biden Kamala Harris um, uh, ticket. So uh, you've got got kind of a traditional strong support there. And uh, there's no doubt. I mean, we, we have uh, two, two nations in the United States as manifested in this vote. And we have um, the vast majority of American Jews uh, on one side and, and conservative and, and um, uh, religious Jews, Orthodox Jews uh, tend to be on the other side, but in a, in a very small minority. Uh, and you've, so you've got that gulf. You've got a growing gulf, as you're referring to, between the American Jewish community, particularly the younger generation, uh, and Israel, um, a, a, a growing gulf. And again, I think, you know, Bibi decided that he wanted to go with the evangelicals. He wanted to go with the right wing. And uh, a lot of people in the Jewish community feel like uh, orphans, that Israel really doesn't care about them anymore, they care about what they think. 
um, and that's in the reform community as well. And so I think that, that um, it, it's a dangerous uh, gulf that has opened up um, that needs to be repaired. And, and given that that's, that's the main message uh, of Biden's presidency, that's his mandate that he's claiming is one of, of reducing divisions and promoting greater comity, uh, not just within America, but between America and, and the world and, and certainly between America and its uh, strong ally Israel. So, I, you know, I think that, that uh, this should be a time to heal, as, as he said in his uh, speech the other night. Uh, and we should be looking to find ways to heal um, the, the, the great uh, chasm that's opened up between the American Jewish community and, and Israel. Uh, what about the, the military commitment of, uh, of all administrations to Israel? Will it remain, you know, uh, securing Israel's quality, edge, et cetera? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Biden is deeply committed to Israel's security and well-being. Um, he has a 40-year record of that, and uh, I don't think anybody would, would question uh, that commitment. Uh, uh, but, you know, again, I think that there's, there's great opportunity here. Um, Israel is not uh, the weak, isolated, uh, small country it, it used to be. It's a, as Bibi says, it's a, it's a regional power. He says it's a global power. Well, it's not exaggerated. It's a regional power of great consequence, with great capabilities, and a potential for strong alliances uh, with the Sunni Arab world um, that are being built as we speak. And that will, th those alliances will serve as the platform in which an America that still has interests in the region, even though they're reduced and even though its focus will be elsewhere, that platform is what the United States has a very strong interest in getting behind and building uh, as the way of stabilizing the region and as a way of consolidating the peace and, of, you know, as I say, eventually, gradually resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict too. And that can create a new architecture for the uh, security architecture for the region in which Israel plays a vital role with the support of the United States. Finally, last week we com uh, commemorated the 25th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Surely you have some recollections of him. Can you share them with us? Thank you uh, for asking that, Uri, and for remembering. Uh, Yitzhak on, on, at this time. Um, I did write a piece for the Wall Street Journal, which was published uh, in, in its Saturday edition, which I'll uh, send you and perhaps you can circulate to the participants. Um, but, but in it, I'll just summarize it quickly, which is that I think that, that Rabin's legacy, um, when it comes to uh, Israel and its um, uh, security dilemmas was very clear about uh, two things. The first, I think we need to remember, and you will surely remember, was his insistence on changing Israel's priorities away from settlements towards development of the Negev and the Galilee and, and towards development of Israel's communities and secondly, a resolution of Israel's conflicts with its neighbors, uh, not only the Palestinians, but it turned out to be the main thing. But how did he want to do this? You know, I've noticed that, that uh, in the context of, of the Trump plan that, that um, Israel uh, right-wing uh, advocates uh, were making the claim that Rabin never agreed to a Palestinian state, which is true. Uh, what he defined uh, was uh, exactly what was defined in the Trump plan, which is not true. Uh, and what, what the, the legacy of Rabin that I think needs to be remembered 25 years later was his commitment 
to a gradual reconciliation between Israel and the Palestinians, a step-by-step -step process in which the final outcome he would not define deliberately. He didn't believe that Arafat was reconciled to it and he didn't believe Israel was ready for that final compromise. And so he, he believed in a gradual step-by-step -step approach uh, of, of building trust and confidence. And that's what I think we really need to return to, but it was on the basis of one fundamental principle, separation from the Palestinians out of respect, not out of hatred. Those were his last words in Washington before he went back to Israel and was assassinated. And he spoke mm. after the it, signing of the Oslo uh, Accord. Let's, let's make sure we get that article and we will circulate it. Uh, and you. also, there are some outstanding uh, questions. So we, with your permission, we'll send it to you and uh, you'll answer them, okay? Yeah, with pleasure. Not today. I got a busy day, but I'll do it tomorrow. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Ambassador Endic, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. And we would be happy to host you again anytime in the future. And like to thank my colleagues at JPC, Talia Dek and Rachel Lexiel for facilitating this webinar. Thank you all for being with us today. Stay tuned to our next event. See you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ori.